Good evening, everyone. My name is Caroline O'Regan and welcome to the RCSI University of Health Sciences. Tonight's leadership lecture is delivered by Professor Michael West and the title is The Courage of Compassion in a Crisis, Leadership for Now and Leadership for the Future. Michael is an expert, taught leader, researcher and a very dear friend. We have asked Michael to speak tonight about the challenges facing our leaders and to reflect on what's been happening, particularly during COVID-19 crisis. Michael's slides will be available following his talk. I would like now to hand you over to Mr. Ewan Friel, who is the Managing Director of Healthcare Management. And my, uh, Eunan would like to formally welcome Michael to this talk this evening. Thank you, Eunan. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Caroline. Um, yeah, I would I would like to extend a very warm welcome to to all of you uh, to another RCSI leadership lecture and thank you for taking uh, your valuable time to join us. And my name is Eunan Friel and I have responsibility for the healthcare management space uh, in RCSI. Uh, that, that space includes a, a quality and process improvement center a health outcomes research center and of course our, our hosts for this evening the the institute of leadership uh, for those of you perhaps unfamiliar with the institute we deliver a range of postgraduate academic and executive development programs in health management and leadership and further details are on rcsi.com forward slash leadership uh, maybe before I introduce our speaker, uh, just to cover off one or two um, operational issues. Uh, we hope to keep the session to, to one hour. Uh, our, our lecture will be roughly 35 minutes, excuse me, after which there'll be time for, for your questions and we would welcome those. Uh, please submit the questions uh, by, by email if you could to leadership at rcsi.com. That's leadership at rcsi.com uh, and we will at the end of the session my colleague Tina uh, will do her best to, to pose at least some of those to our speaker at the end of his talk. Uh, your microphones are I believe all muted um, so that should work and, and just to say the the lecture uh, will be recorded uh, and the slides and they will be available on the RCSI website uh, shortly. OK, so Michael, on, on behalf of RCSI, I'm delighted to, uh, to to welcome you here this evening. Michael, we're very fortunate to have someone of, of your experience and insight to talk to us. And, and I think uh, the theme of your talk, uh, leadership or courage and compassion in, in a crisis was never more uh, relevant than in the, the challenging situation we find ourselves in now. Uh, professor West is a senior fellow at the King's Fund London and is professor of organizational psychology at uh, Lancaster University of uh, Lancaster University Management School. He is a fellow of a wide range of prestigious societies and academic institutions, including both the British and American psychological societies. He graduated uh, from the University of Wales in 73 and received his PhD in 77. Uh, the focus of an impressive 30-year research career has really centered on culture and leadership in organizations um, and innovation and team innovation, particularly in health services. He lectures widely nationally and, and internationally on his research and on solutions for developing innovative healthcare organizations. Um, he provides regular policy advice to many UK and international healthcare service organizations, including the NHS, the Department of Health and Social Care England, Health Education England, as well as uh, health departments in Wales and Northern Ireland. And he currently sits on the COVID-19 National Task Force on staff support for the, for the NHS. So Michael, you're extremely welcome back to uh, the Institute of Leadership, even though it's unfortunately in a virtual capacity. Uh, and I would welcome you to give us your lecture, please. 
So an enormous thank you, Yunan, to you and to you, Caroline, to both of you and formally to the Royal College as well for this wonderful opportunity. It feels a real privilege and an honour for me and I'm really grateful. It's a, such a shame I can't be um, in Dublin, of course. Um, this pandemic has created just an extraordinary situation for all of us around the world. And I, I imagine we never thought that we would experience something so transformational. And of course, it's been a time of enormous tragedy and grief and pain for many people around the globe and of enormous difficulty and suffering. And out of these times, I think, comes the opportunity for learning. And no more so, I think, than in the context of our health and care services and what we can learn about leadership now and leadership for the future. I've also been struck by how Ireland has dealt with this crisis and its response to it. And it's really offered a beacon of hope, I think, to many other countries around the world in in how people can come together and work together really successfully in the face of an enormous crisis. So I think there have been some extraordinary developments in health and social care during this period. We've seen compassionate leadership and collective leadership burst out. Health and social care workers have collaborated to innovate in the most astonishing way, in ways that we would never have conceived would be possible in such a short space of time. We've seen that people have changed the way they work. Job titles have become, in some instances, no longer relevant. People haven't been constrained by job titles. There's also been a sense in which people haven't been constrained by the organisations they're part of. We've seen clinical leader, lead, leadership develop at an amazing pace, doctors and nurses stepping up. We've seen, I think, a real softening of hierarchies, in some cases an elimination of hierarchies in order that we can respond in an agile way during this crisis. We've seen national bodies in many countries, and I think in Ireland in particular, national bodies loosen up uh, their approach to provider organisations and the wider health and social care system. They, they have modelled a more collective culture. We've seen an extraordinary growth of team working. Uh, I guess what I've been struck by in, in listening to the accounts of health and social care staff is how many have had to form quite quickly new teams that has, have become almost like their home teams day in, day out, and where there's been a valuing of people from many different backgrounds and members of the care team who might have been partially visible before have become critical members of the care team, for example, um, cleaners. There's been a strong camaraderie. People have shared tea, they've shared cake, they've shared support and love during this time in teams. There's been uh, a real focus on communication and learning at speed, at pace. So people have communicated to each other face to face very quickly, often, of course, via video or uh, via these uh, uh, digital mechanisms. And there's been a, a focus on stepping back continually and learning about how we're responding to the crisis we face and what's been I think powerful in providing the context for all of this has been the response of the people in the communities that we serve. This enormous outpouring of gratitude and compassion towards health and social care staff and a commitment to help. In Ireland, 70,000 volunteers stepping forward to help in the crisis. These have been very dark times, as I said at the beginning, and, and for many of us, the darkest times of our lives. And I always am reminded of the 
the idea that in the darkest times it's it's also the time when the light can come streaming in and and I really believe that now is the moment for the light to come streaming in and I think particularly in relation to our health and social care services uh, it it's right that we should be focused on transforming our health and care services not only now but for the future as well and I want to explore three themes that are, I think have emerged during this crisis as being particularly important and the three, three themes are the importance of compassion, the huge importance of collaboration and teamwork and the, the importance of reflection and learning. So let's let's talk about um, compassion. And I want to begin by pointing out that before the dark times of this pandemic, actually the lights were already very, very dimmed. We had very high levels of stress amongst doctors and nurses and indeed most healthcare staff, health and care staff. Problems of retention, many vacancies and all of the data we had from across most European countries was a health service at breaking point because of the stress that health and social care staff were under. And then along came the pandemic to add to the pressures on our staff. And I think what's emerged during this period, above all, has been a strong, compassionate response from the public, from health and social care staff, from people across our countries. Compassion I think is the core value of our health and social care organizations. Compassion is, we know, the most important intervention there is in health and social care. Uh, a recent review last year by Treziak and Mazzarella in the United States, and it, this is shown on the first slide, has confirmed how powerful compassion is as, as a healthcare intervention. So a few examples here. We know that compassion from anaesthetists pre-surgery is associated with a dramatic uh, post-surgical requirement for painkillers and much shorter hospital stays. We know that patients with terminal cancer who are randomly assigned to compassionate palliative care survive much longer. We know that when clinicians behave compassionately in their interactions, this is in randomized control trials with HIV patients, that there's a dramatically lower likelihood of the virus being found in the blood. And if we go to the second slide, we also know that compassion does not take longer in the encounters that clinicians have with patients and service users. Moreover, when clinicians themselves are compassionate, we see subsequently they have much lower levels of stress and anxiety and depression. And compassion, compassionate healthcare actually costs a lot less and the quality of care is significantly higher. And the size of the effects of compassion are astonishingly great. So I think compassion is our starting point in this. And it's what we've seen, as I say, is the core value during this crisis and the core value, I think, of our health and care organisations. And the, the question for us is how can we, during this crisis and more importantly beyond, sustain compassion within our health and care organisations? And I think the answer to that is, of course, the culture of our organizations and culture is a consequence of every interaction by every one of us every day, how we behave, how kind we are, how cynical we are, how compassionate we are, how irritable we are, how civil we are, how caring we are, shapes the culture of our organizations. But the role of leaders is particularly powerful. So if we want to sustain, develop further, cultures of compassion within our healthcare organisations, then our leaders at every level, from our 
politicians who steer our health services down to frontline supervisors must model compassion in their leadership. And what that means is that leaders have to embody the four behaviours of compassion. The four behaviours are attending to the other person. Nancy Klein uses a wonderfully evocative phrase, listening with fascination. It's understanding the challenges, the pain, the distress of the other. It's empathising with them, caring for them, feeling their pain, and it's then helping the other person. And so compassionate leadership means paying attention to those we lead, listening with fascination. It means uh, arriving at a shared understanding of the challenges that they face, not imposing an understanding. It, it's about empathising with staff, feeling for them. And as I mentioned, levels of stress among staff in our health and care services have reached unsustainable levels. So it's right that our leaders should be empathising with staff. And that gives the motivation for the fourth element, which is helping or serving those we lead. It's about uh, finding, making sure they have the resources they need or removing the obstacles that get in the, in the way of them. Uh, delivering the high quality care they want to deliver. And make no mistake that these four behaviours are not soft candles and pilates uh, and cushions. They're about real courage because to really listen to staff deeply means that we will hear things we don't want to hear. We don't have enough staff. It'll mean um, in seeking to ha have a shared understanding that we find that our interpretation of the challenges may differ from those of the people we lead and empathizing with them, feeling for them may, means feeling un uncomfortable. The, the, the nurse who's on a third 12 hour night shift and doesn't have time to take a break uh, or even um, get a drink or some food and then having the commitment to help to remove obstacles or acquire resources if we possibly can that takes courage. And I want to really emphasize that compassion, compassionate leadership is, is not easy. And there are lots of myths around what compassionate leadership is, 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 all, is all about or not all about. Um, Nelson Mandela, if we go to the next si slide, is I think one of the totemic figures of leadership. When he was released from Robben Island prison back in the early 1990s, uh, what he did was to go against all his followers. Rather than taking up arms against the apartheid government, he went against the hundreds of thousands of his ANC followers and committed to reconciliation and peaceful negotiation in a context that was a cauldron of violence and hatred. And he, because of his greater compassion for the society, for the country he served, was successful in bringing about a relatively peaceful biracial South African society. Uh, he had the commitment to purpose and performance. He, he was determined to, uh, to pursue his vision his compassionate vision for a peaceful South Africa. He didn't take an easy consensus way forward. He challenged the status quo and he was determined to create compassionate institutions and leadership is compassionate. Leadership is not only about how we behave it as individuals, it, it's creating our institutions to to be compassionate. So this issue of compassion somehow, compassionate leadership somehow being a soft way of leading, I think, is as far from the truth as it's been. And and in fact, what we see, what we've seen during this crisis is that our compassionate leaders in health and social care at every level have been focused on ensuring effective leadership, inclusive leadership, collective leadership and leading across boundaries. And if we can see the next slide, you'll see that what that means is that in addition to those four behaviours, we've seen leaders with a really strong focus on 
being effective on responding to this crisis by ensuring that everyone they lead in their teams and organizations has had a clear sense of purpose and vision that they have worked together to align their efforts around that vision and they've through the, the compassionate collective approach that has generally been adopted i know across ireland they've built trust and motivation so that people have aligned their efforts around achieving high quality care for the for the people of ireland during this period the leadership's also been inclusive as i said earlier we've seen leaders including as highly valued members of their teams uh, people from other organizations people from different professional backgrounds the cleaners the porters the paramedics voluntary sector organizations people who've been retired uh, and volunteers from members of the public regardless of the differences between us the color of skin the professional background the years of experience all have been valued and that's what inclusive leadership is and we've seen leadership that has been collective that has included everybody and conferred on everybody the the importance or a sense of importance of their leadership during this crisis and the value that they can bring and building a sense of uh, sharedness around leadership rather than it being hierarchical and command and control and we've seen a strong emphasis on working across boundaries the health and care systems working together in a very short space of, of time in ways we couldn't have conceived of three or four months ago and working with the voluntary sector and working with uh, with uh, the public and I particularly want to emphasize how important collective leadership has been. We've seen that suddenly everyone has leadership responsibility. The people cleaning the ICUs, the paramedics, the members of the public contributing, the military taking part, everybody has had leadership responsibility. We've seen shared leadership in teams where it hasn't been overly hierarchical and command and control we may have had hierarchical leaders but leadership has been shared so that people within teams with expertise have had the leadership seamlessly shift to them and if we go to the next slide we'll see that that third point that we we've had a strong emphasis on interdependent leadership uh, all of us working together across boundaries at speed prioritizing health and happiness for all of the people of Ireland in a way as I say that was inconceivable just a few months ago and what we've seen is I think more consistent approaches to leadership within the leadership community what I've heard from Ireland is more consistent approaches across the HSE and from the and from top to bottom and, and I have been reflecting lately uh, how our leaders in different countries have been behaving. We know that the key, the most important leadership styles for effective leaders are leaders who are authentic in the way they lead, leaders who are open and honest, behave with integrity, leaders who show humility, not by seeking to please people, but by constantly seeking feedback and, and asking others for input and advice. This has been a time when many of us haven't known what to do and good leaders, effective leaders have been seeking advice and asking for, for guidance and leaders who uh, have been appreciative, constantly saying thank you, showing appreciation and leaders who have above all been compassionate so compassionate leadership has been absolutely critical during this crisis and I think the second important theme that's emerged during the crisis is the importance of teamwork and collaboration of course we've known that teamwork and collaboration is important in health and social care since we created our health and social care systems uh, the problem have been, has been that we've been less effective than perhaps we should have been in developing effective leadership and what we've seen during this crisis is the emergence of team leadership and team behaviors uh, that teach us how to be effective in in teams and what's been striking too in reflecting on 
the darkness before we came into this pandemic of the levels of stress amongst healthcare workers, the the need to ensure that we deliver high quality care, the need to innovate, is that we've known for some years that when people have a home team, a team they feel a part of, they belong in, they feel loved in, they feel cared for, when we're in those teams, when we work in such teams, then those teams deliver high quality care, they innovate, and the health and well being of the staff who work in them is dramatically better. And what we've seen during the crisis is a growing recognition that more important perhaps than people's technical and professional skills are their skills of team working. It's at least as important in our teams that our team members have the skills of working well in teams as their professional technical skills. We've seen the importance of shared vision and values and, and the uh, the clarifying of a limited number of objectives, four or five for our teams, rather than overwhelming them with multiple priorities. We've seen that that kind of clear vision and direction for every team has enabled them to respond well in the crisis. There's a lesson for the future, not overwhelming people with endless priorities. And we've seen the importance of people being clear about their roles and the roles of others in their teams during this crisis. And softening, eradicating hierarchical differences, valuing each member of the team, valuing each member of the team equally regardless of their professional background, valuing each member of the team regardless of their race, regardless of their gender, regardless of their uh, work experience. And, and, and th this issue of inclusivity and valuing differences is so important and I think it's emerged in this crisis. We've seen the disproportionate effects of the pandemic on staff from BME backgrounds in Western European countries, the United States, and in terms of the general population. And, and, and what it tells us is how damaging lack of inclusivity is to our, to our populations. We, we created our health services on the basis of inclusiveness and compassion and, and now is the moment when we have to address these issues of discrimination and racism and inclusivity because inclusive teams are more productive, more innovative uh, and just happier places for people to be. And of course, what we've seen is mutual support, compassion, check, caring, people in teams checking in on each other, supporting each other. Uh, as I said, uh, sharing tea breaks and cake with each other. And, and you know, that may seem trivial, but we know that eating together, sharing uh, our hot drinks and cakes together is astonishingly, this is based on r randomized control trials associated with higher quality care. Um, as I say, we've seen uh, effective communication, frequent contact and lots more cross team working and, and support for each other uh, during the crisis. So people working across team boundaries, people working across organizational boundaries, asking the question always, how can we help you? What can we do to help you be effective in responding to this crisis? That's a key lesson for the future. So these um, these lessons of leadership for teams, I think, are absolutely vital. And remember that if we can build, of course, all of our health and social care staff have to work in multiple teams. But when we ensure that they're held by a home team where they come back on a regular basis to do their learning, quality improvement and sharing, their mental health is much better. The quality of care is better. And as we've seen during this crisis, levels of innovation are dramatically higher. And the third area is the importance of reflection or learning. We know that taking time out to reflect and review is important for individuals, teams and organisations. You know, just before we started this webinar, Yunan and Caroline and Tina and colleagues and I were talking about the time we've been spending in nature during this crisis and how more aware of nature we've become, how more connected we felt and how nourishing that's been. And 
when as individuals, as humans, we take time out to reflect, to be still, whether it's practicing mindfulness or our meditation practice or to be in peaceful, beautiful places. This lake you can hear, see here is about four or five miles from my house and it's a really favorite spot for me to find that peace and stillness. When we do that, we're much more productive. We, are, we have better mental health and we have our creative thoughts in those spaces. And when we look at health and social care teams under pressure, what we've seen in our research over 30 years now is that teams that take time out on a regular basis to stop, reflect and review are much more productive, much more innovative uh, and mental health of team members is, is better. And during this crisis, what we've seen is teams coming together into huddles frequently to stop, to review, to learn, to adapt, to change. And rather than continuing to spin the hamster wheel, which seems to have been the pattern in our health and social care organizations over the years, we've seen teams learn to take time out on a regular basis. And actually what the research evidence tells us is that teams that do that, this is based on tens of uh, published studies, teams that do that are between 35 and 40% more productive. So having after action reviews, debriefs, huddles, away days is vital for team effectiveness. And even at the organizational level, we found that organizations in health and social care and in other settings that have a, a commitment to reflection and learning in this way are much more innovative uh, than other organizations. So that theme of reflection is absolutely vital also. So those three, I think, are key lessons for us during this crisis to learn from. Now is the moment for us to let the light in. And now is the moment, I think, for us to sustain the lessons of learning about leadership that we can take from this very difficult, dark period. But in order for us to have the capacity as leaders to practice compassion and lead our teams and encourage reflection amongst our staff and teams and in our organizations as a whole, we have to practice, I think, for self-compassion. That means paying attention to ourselves, stopping and listening with fascination, understanding the challenges we face during this crisis and in our work organizations and in our lives generally and caring for ourselves, empathizing with ourselves. And then taking action to help ourselves in order that we can be who we can be and stay close. To the core values that give our lives meaning like compassion and wisdom and humanity. And justice, so. This is the time, I believe, when the light can come streaming in and where we can transform our health and care services to meet to meet the challenges we face now and in the future. We have to develop our understanding of how to build belonging and trust in our organizations and to build climates in our team of compassion in our teams of compassion and to build cultures of compassion in our organizations it's humans that make up teams and organizations and networks in health and social care and so i think we must come to understand we must come to see ourselves and those we work with as more caring more collaborative and more compassionate in order that we can effectively shape the future of health and care services in Ireland and indeed the future of, of our world. Go Rev Mossagod, thank you. So thank you very much, um, Professor West for, for that lovely um, piece around leadership and compassionate leadership and collective leadership and of what we've been doing 
since you've been on the air, is taking in a number of questions from people in Ireland and from the UK. So welcome to everybody, our colleagues in the UK who have chosen to join us this evening as well. So Michael, you spoke very eloquently about your years of research into compassionate and collaborative research. And you also spoke about the pressures that health systems have been under before this crisis started and letting the light in now. Do you feel that we're really ready to embrace um, compassionate leadership as individuals, as professions and as organisations? Has the era of compassionate and collective leadership, has it arrived? Yes, mm. absolutely yes. Uh, I've been so moved, I think, as many people have by the selflessness and courage and kindness of our health and social care staff over this period. It, it's, I think, the responsibility of all of us to now ensure that their commitment is honoured and respected. And what I hear in across health and social care systems is a it is a determination and a commitment to creating compassionate cultures. And what I think we have to do is to translate that commitment into action. As I said, we were already at a very dark place before the pandemic, and it's almost as though as a result of all of this tragedy and pain and suffering, we've had the opportunity to learn a really powerful lesson about the importance of connection and the centrality of health and care services in our society. I believe that now our health and care services are probably the most important institution in our society for encouraging compassion, you know, because a huge proportion of our workforce uh, work in those health and care services. And if they work in compassionate cultures, they take that compassion back out to their families and communities. And if all of those who use our health and social, social care services encounter compassionate care, they take that out to their families and their communities. And so health and social care is the institution, I think, that can nurture and spread compassion across our countries at a time when we desperately need it. And for, for that reason, all the more, I think it's important that we are determined to ensure that we transform and sustain cultures of compassion across our systems. OK, thank you very much, um, Professor West, for that. There's many comments coming in around establishing cultures that will support compassionate leadership and collaborative leadership and how we might do that, how we might support teams doing that. And a, a number of comments asking about how we can maintain compassionate leadership when we have new models of care delivery, such as telemedicine and remote um, engagement with patients. Have you any advice to give um, in those kinds of situations that we're likely to see into the future? So there's two questions there. The first, I think, is is about how we develop cultures of compassionate care, high quality care. And of course, as I said, uh, every one of us can play a role in that because how we behave every day uh, will make a difference. So yeah. by listening, by uh, understanding, uh, by empathizing and by seeking to help. The more we practice those behaviours every day, we won't be perfect at them, but the more we practice them, the more we help to create, nurture those cultures of high quality care. Uh, we also have available now um, many tools to help organisations develop such cultures. And I know that colleagues in Ireland and certainly the four UK countries and other countries are now using uh, open source tools that uh, many people have been involved in producing uh, that um, support organisations to transform their cultures. And that's about making sure that all our organisational processes um, are underpinned by compassion, by those four behaviours and by the commitment to effective, inclusive, collective and cross-system leadership. During the pandemic, of course, there's been this transformation of how we interact and 
there is no doubt that when we interact across screens in, in this way, we lose some of the nuances of face to face contact. Uh, we know that human beings are exquisitely hardwired to pick up information from each other's faces, subtle facial gestures, body postures, movements and so on. And we've, we lose some of that. We've lost the ability to hug each other at times because not the ability, but the freedom to hug each other at times and to touch. And that's so important. And uh, so what we have to do during these times is to, I think, overcompensate. So, you know, some people use Im these little emoticons to, in their emails. Um, uh, uh, others are taking the time at the beginning and end of tele interactions to inquire about the well-being, well-being of families and uh, the beautiful things in people's lives to be concerned with each other, to care for each other. And those those small uh, gestures can go a long way to compensating for some of the losses of this uh, distancing technology. But there are many aspects of that technology which is also very helpful. Many patients don't want to travel a long distance to have a, uh, a long wait in a waiting room for a consultation which could take place over a telephone. And what we've seen is that many members of the public and patients have actually benefited from uh, this different style of interaction. So there are, I think, uh, things to gain from what we've seen and uh, uh, we've seen many organisations innovating in this space of new technologies and digital for the benefit of patients and quality of care and also for the benefit of clinicians. And I think part of what we need to do as we go forward is to make sure that patients and communities are involved in the genuine co-design of the services we, we offer because that's uh, an enormous part of what we've seen during this uh, pandemic as well and there's a great deal to learn from that. So both I think taking personal responsibility for culture, using the tools that are available to transform our organisations uh, and compensating for the difficulties of technologies and working with patients and communities to co-design the services that we offer in the future. Thank you, Michael. Um, there's a couple of questions where people are now starting to future focus. And many, many people over the past couple of months have stepped up and into leadership roles. And this is the time of year when we see our young graduates also entering the workplace, young doctors and nurses and health and social care professions. What advice can you give to people who may be seeking leadership roles or stepping into leadership roles at this time? We need you desperately. Um, and, and we need those around you to foster your leadership. What we hear from many doctors and nurses transitioning into their first roles is that their confidence is undermined by, in some cases, by how they're treated by their colleagues around them. And it is the responsibility of all of us to help to develop their confidence and their sense of competence and their leadership skills. I think one of the really powerful lessons of this pandemic has been how hierarchy and bureaucracy and the control of some national organisations in the past has stifled the leadership of clinicians and especially um, people at, as it were, lower hierarchical levels in the organisation. What we have to do in health and social care is, I think, get rid of that hierarchy, um, soften it, erase parts of it, in health and social care, we have probably the most skilled and motivated workforce in any area of industry. Why do we manage them through command and control? Why do we have so many levels of hierarchy? It makes no sense. It's a paradox. So I think we have to encourage nurses entering the profession, doctors entering the prof profession to see that they have a leadership role and to encourage them to take responsibility for leadership and actually in our training of nurses and doctors to ensure that we are nurturing, cultivating in them an understanding and the practice of compassionate leadership. Thank you very much for that. And I have one final one comment from Davina, who says that listening to you this evening has given her hope. 
And I must say, when we're watching you here this evening, there's a great sense of calmness in this chaos and this very complicated situation. So if you don't mind sharing with us, what gives you calmness personally at this time? So those five elements that I think give all of us a sense of well-being and calmness, the most important by far is spending time in whatever way we can with the people we love and who love us. That's the most important factor, I think, in human well-being. It's also, um, for me, I've practiced meditation for most of my life since I was a student in University in Wales and I go sit by my pond in my garden every day for a period of time to practice meditation, which is um, actually just about simply sitting with openness and contentment and being. Um, it's being present, it's being in the here and now, it's being in nature, it's continuing to learn and grow as I do every day, I have the privilege of doing every day. It's uh, um, taking exercise, um, e even in the context of, of not being able to foray out on my bicycle. And, and it, it's also being able to contribute and help others, which is why I said at the beginning, this is such a privilege and honor for me because helping others is such a powerful way of achieving a sense of connection uh, and a, sen a wider sense of belonging. So um, it, it, it has truly been a privilege for me and why I say uh, go rev mos sagot. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'm going to hand over back to Yunan now. We're going to hand back to Yunan Freel now. Thank you. Thank you, Tina, and, and thank you, Michael, for a, a truly both inspiring and, and calming lecture. I think I haven't had this calm in a long time. Uh, I, I was joking about coming to this meeting from a finance committee meeting, and I think it was it was just what I needed. Um, so, um, Michael, you've you've left us with with a great deal to think about. Um, I, I think your your opening um, image of uh, letting the light come streaming into periods of darkness uh, is really powerful one, uh, and 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 you know challenging us to think about the sense of a common purpose uh, in a crisis to unlock the, the true potential is of human beings to act individually and to act uh, to, together. Um, and, and I think you've left us with a really interesting question of to try and understand what is the, di what is the difference between this crisis uh, and I guess the normal level of crisis that too often defines our, our health service um, and how come in many ways we can get it so right um, when we have to and, and yet enjoy a huge sense of frustration personally, organizationally, when we seem to get it wrong uh, coming up to this. Um, your, your challenge of, of a new kind of leadership talked about uh, the importance of, uh, of compassion and compassionate leadership. Um, and, and I guess the, the sort of hard edge of compassionate leadership and, and, and it not being soft and cuddly as you described, the, the, the clinical impact, not just on the patients, uh, but on, on the, the healthcare workers themselves um, that accrues from, from demonstrating it. Uh, and, and I think I love the idea of, of listening with fascination. I think it's something that our busy lives often stifle, but really, 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 really important. Um, and I think uh, challenged us as, as leaders to be to be role models every day uh, in, in those things. Um, the the power of teamwork and collaboration and inclusiveness, um, the necessity of feeling like you belong to a to a home team. Um, I think was 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 also a very powerful message, um, and and I think it was in there you you stumbled on this idea of uh, the the importance of that team being able to galvanize around a single focus, a single objective, a single priority, and and, and as you reflect on potentially 
you know, what are those differences that enable productivity and output and pride and, and result now versus in the past? It is probably a lot to do with decluttering people's agendas um, and, and making clear what the priorities are, which has to be uh, a challenge for, for all, uh, all leaders. Um, the importance of learning, reflection, review, clearly tied to the team piece, um, you know, how to be a learning organization. It's very easy to say it and to believe it intellectually. It's, it's challenging to live it and to find the space. Uh, you know, a, a local observation, we um, were dealing with the Institute, we're dealing with our own hospital group, uh, and they were inviting us to come in and support learning in, in, and reflection in, in very, very high pressure teams uh, through after action review learning sessions, which some of our team members support. And I was really, really struck by the, the leadership they showed when, when they could be leaders who were putting out another fire and running over and back and up and down. And they were able to stand back and try and to support those teams to take a minute at the end of the shift to look back on what we did, what worked, what didn't work how we work together and maybe how we might work differently. So really important. So for, for all of that, I think you've left us with the challenge to to really understand what it is that it has unlocked the capacity of, of human beings who work in healthcare, who choose to give their lives to healthcare, how they work individually and, and, and teams to transform outcomes and to make to make broader society really, really proud of healthcare and people who work in healthcare. And, and often that hasn't been the case, uh, certainly in this country. You know, the NHS has probably enjoyed more favorable public acclaim than, than our system has here. So I think it behooves us to really understand this test case uh, of better outcomes, better leadership, different leadership, more passion and stepping and, and stepping up the importance of a clear priority, uh, the importance of unlocking that that different type of, of leadership that shows compassion, that facilitates reflection, that is inclusive, um, and that notion of the power of the home team. Um, and I, I think through the questions there, understanding its capacity to unlock um, innovation. So. Again, um, I'm not a great student, but that is as, that's as much as I could uh, squeeze into into my head for the for the lecture. So again, on behalf of the R C Society Institute of Leadership, uh, and I hope more broadly the people who are all uh, listening to this lecture, thank you very 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 much for your lecture and uh, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. So I think it's over to me now to um, thank you so very much for that, Michael. Um, huge fan of your work, as you know. Um, your lecture is available on podcasts and additional supports that you have very generously made available to the college is also available on our website. And we very much look forward to welcoming you, Michael, and Susie Bailey from the King's Fund back with us very soon. And finally, I'd just like to remind our audience that we're back next Thursday um, with our conversation that matters on leadership learnings, reflections on a career in healthcare with Mr. Lorcan Berthissel and Dr. Justin Brophy. And for our audience, any suggestions on future conversations that matter, if you could please email the RCSI leadership at rcsi.com. So a huge heartfelt thank you again, Michael. Um, thank you to our listeners and a big thank you, huge thank you to our team who work relentlessly behind the scenes to make this evening happen. So good night and everyone enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.